Hi, I'm Dr. Steve Klein from the Department of Communication at the University of Missouri. Welcome to another in a series of online video lessons intended to provide you important principles and helpful concepts for the study of communication. In a previous video in this series, we went over the process of perception, that cognitive process that enables us to determine meaning and to make sense of what we encounter and experience around us. And in this video, we're going to focus on how we perceive other people, because the ways in which we make sense of and derive what people mean as a person when we encounter them is fundamentally important to any kind of communication we're going to have with this person, about this person, in a variety of different contexts. So that's what this video is about. Now, in order to understand how we perceive other people, let's just really quickly review how the perception process works. Bearing in mind that, again, what perception essentially is, is the process by which we make sense of and derive meaning out of what we're observing or experiencing in our lives, there are three primary steps we need to bear in mind. The first is the step of selection, where we make determinations either consciously, semi-consciously, or subconsciously about what kind of sensory information we are actually going to take in and try to make sense of, with the understanding that we can't possibly make sense out of everything our senses tell us. So we make some deliberate principled choices. Once we select the stimuli we're interested in, the next step is organization, where we take all of the information that we've just gathered and we try to categorize it, put it into sequences or aspects of similarity and difference that enable us to try to cohere all of the different information that we're taking all at the same time. Once we've organized the informational input that we have, the last step is interpretation, where we take all of this information that we've just curated for ourselves and we run it through our cognitive database of various schemata, structures of past perceptions and experiences and knowledge that we use as a basis for making sense of any kind of new experience. And this three-step process of selection, organization, and interpretation is a process that's a cycle, and it's an ongoing one. We're constantly in the process of selecting and organizing new stimuli based on prior interpretations of previous experiences. Now, with this in mind, if this is how perception operates generally, how can we understand how perception operates specifically when we're dealing with how to perceive other people? And that's where the concept of attribution comes into play. Attribution essentially is the interpretation step of perception when we're talking about other people. Specifically, when we attribute, what we're doing is we're constructing explanations we create for others' behavior. We experience what someone says and what someone does and how someone appears when we meet them, whether uh, very closely or if we observe them from afar. And what we're constantly trying to do is explain why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they saying what they're saying? This is the key interpretation that we try to make sense of when we encounter other people. Let's take a look at a pretty unique example of behavior that we might encounter where it really presents us with the question, why is she behaving like that? And this example comes from one of my favorite films, the 1985 teen drama classic, The Breakfast Club. What's your problem?
even though we're studying the social science behind this phenomenon right now, in many ways we're experts in attribution. We've been spending our entire lives constructing explanations for the behavior that other people exhibit when we encounter them. So let's do that right now. Uh, before we go any further, pause the video and jot down two or three possible explanations that you can come up with for why Allison behaved in such a strange way during lunch in that film clip we just saw. Oh wait. No, for real. Pause the video and jot down a couple of things, and then once you've done that, then you can turn it back on. Okay, now we're back. Now, in thinking about attribution, there's some important concepts that we need to bear in mind. First of all, we need to note that there are at least two major categories of attributions. The first is internal attributions. These are explanations that connect the cause of behaviors to personal aspects, such as personality traits. This is the kind of attribution when we explain that somebody behaved in a certain way because of the kind of person they are, their character, their internal identity, uh, their essence or nature as a person. So for instance, uh, you might have come up with some internal attributions regarding Allison's behavior. Perhaps she's just a strange person. Uh, she is really trying to draw attention to herself because she wants the attention. Maybe she's just intrinsically odd, right? Those are things that have to do with her inner character and personality her psychology, uh, the way that you're interpreting it based on the behavior she's presenting. The second category are external attributions. External attributions are explanations that connect the cause of behaviors to situational factors. So instead of watching behaviors and then drawing specific conclusions about the kind of person someone is inside, you might explain their behavior because of the surrounding environment or context. So, for instance, in this clip, you might think to yourself, well, Allison is in a Saturday detention with four other kids who are possibly strangers to her, and she may be concerned about how these other people are judging her. So, what she might do then is to engage in some oddly strange behavior in order to try to put a distance between herself and them. These might be behaviors that otherwise she wouldn't engage in if it wasn't for the fact that she was in this forced situation with these other people that normally she wouldn't spend any time with. Now, it's important to note that there are potential internal and external attributions that can happen at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. But these are the two different dimensions that we can think of that provide a basis for explaining behavior. Now, that being said, there are a variety of different factors, according to the research literature, that affect the way that we attribute explanations to the behavior of others. These variables include things like physical characteristics, the way that someone's face and body looks, the kind of clothing that they wear, and so forth, can be really important. Research tells us, for instance, that for good or ill, we tend to attribute more positive motives or positive reasons behind behavior if we find find somebody physically attractive or interesting. Environment can be another really important factor. When we observe somebody's behavior, we see it in the context of a surrounding setting, a time or a place. And whether or not that environment is a swanky restaurant or an executive boardroom or the bleachers at a major league baseball park, people's behaviors are going to be evaluated by us based on whatever relationship of propriety or impropriety that behavior might have to the surrounding environment. Culture can be really important as well as we try to provide explanations for people's behavior. And this can be important on a couple of levels. Obviously, our assumptions about the ways in which people can and should behave are going to be heavily influenced by our own cultural upbringing. What are the beliefs and values and norms and expectations that we take for granted as quote unquote normal or different than the norm when we see them? But it's not just our own culture, it's our perceptions of other cultures. To the extent that we have either an accurate or an inaccurate set of beliefs and expectations about someone from another culture, we may attribute 
motivations or rationales for behavior that could be rather inaccurate if we don't really have a good understanding of the cultural beliefs and values and norms and assumptions that are informing why that person is behaving in the way that they are. And of course, we can't undersell personality as a really important factor as well. The research literature tells us, and this may be rather predictable, that extroverted, uh, socially skilled personalities tend to receive more positive attributions from us than those who are introverted or have difficulties in social communication skills. So given that we now know that Anytime somebody observes our behavior, they're going to engage in a process of interpreting why it is we're behaving in the way that we are. The notion of social impressions is going to be really important. We have some control over the extent to which folks are going to be able to observe our behaviors and draw some conclusions from them. And so some kind of awareness of the importance of the impressions is going to be, well, important he redundantly said redundantly. One of the most important phenomena in the area of impression management when it comes to attribution is the primacy effect. In brief, we place more value on the first information we receive about a person. As soon as we meet a new person for the first time, we immediately start the process of trying to assess whether or not this person is going to be a threat or a concern, or whether or not this is somebody that we would have a positive experience continuing to interact with. And we make these impressions pretty quickly. But how long does it take to make that first impression? Well, according to a lot of well-documented evidence, just seven seconds, three seconds for a purely appearance-based assessment, and then four seconds for that very first communication impression. That's all it takes. Now, while the old cliche from the television commercial, you never get a second chance to make a first impression, uh, has some truth and merit to it, that isn't necessarily going to be fatal if that first impression was a problematic one. We do have an opportunity, not necessarily to make those enduring initial impressions go away because the primacy effect is pretty powerful, but we can mitigate it thanks to another phenomenon called the recency effect. In brief, we put more weight on the most recent impression we have of a person's communication over earlier impressions. As we continue to interact with someone over time, we're continually attributing their behavior based on the impressions that we got due to the primacy effect. However, that social interaction is going to end at a certain point. And when a particular communication interaction ends, the memory we have of that encounter is going to be the best way that we have to engage in subsequent evaluation and judgment of the behavior and the motivations behind that behavior. And so the thing that happens last is going to be the thing that's easiest for us to remember because we don't have to reach further back in our long-term memory to be able to get that. So basically the most important things that we see in a person when we meet them for the first time and start to attribute behavior are the very first impressions due to the primacy effect and the very last impressions due to the recency effect now the weight of these initial impressions we have when first interacting with a new person are really important because those enduring impressions are going to influence the way in which we attribute and evaluate all of the rest of their behavior. And sometimes this can lead to some problematic errors. One phenomenon that is really tricky is what's often referred to as halos and horns. There are a couple of related effects that both operate in a very similar manner. The halo effect refers to how initial positive perceptions of a person lead us to view later interactions as positive. If somebody really made a strong first impression, really stood out as a positive personality, someone who was, well, impressive, then we're going to look at their communication subsequently through that positive lens. And while sometimes this can be accurate, other times it can lead us to overlook later problematic behaviors. We might explain away or even selectively ignore problematic behaviors that happen later on because, well, I know this is a good person and they're a good person largely because of that strong first impression. At the same time, we have the horns effect, 
where initial negative perceptions lead us to view later interactions as negative. And this is one we really want to be sure that we watch out for if one of our interests is to make sure that we give the people that we're interacting with a fair and equitable shot at communicating with us in a fair and productive manner. If someone happens to have a really negative first impression on us, that really negative first impression is going to lead the way that we interpret and attribute their subsequent behaviors. And so while this can sometimes be accurate, this can also lead us to overlook or downplay or falsely misinterpret later behaviors they engage in that could actually be quite positive because they made that initial bad impression on us. Uh, think about uh, the old expression, uh, they left a bad taste in my mouth and that bad taste stays there. So even if that person later on provides you some behavior that is delicious, socially speaking, we might not necessarily be able to overlook the initial bad taste in our mouth. And so we could be giving somebody an unfair subsequent evaluation. Both halo effects and horns effects are magnified by what is probably the most important mistake that we make when we engage in attribution. And that's what's referred to researchers in this area as the fundamental attribution error. Put simply, the fundamental attribution error is our tendency to explain others' behaviors using internal rather than external attributions. In other words, we tend to interpret people's behavior based on some kind of intrinsic, innate qualities or characteristics that that person has as a person, as opposed to thinking about what is often much more complicated in external contextual influences on the way that someone might be acting in a specific situation. In order to illustrate this idea, I want to show us another classic clip from that classic film, The Breakfast Club, and in this instance, focus on the character of John Bender. Bender is attending a suburban high school uh, in the Chicagoland area, and he is in the same Saturday morning detention as our friend Allison from the Captain Crunch sandwich earlier. Bender is trying to better understand the people that he's in detention with and the other kids that are in detention with him are trying to find out more about Bender. And one of the problems that we see coming from all of these characters are the ways in which they initially attribute the behavior that they're seeing to internal intrinsic personality and character elements rather than thinking about all of the various pressures and social and economic and cultural variables that are impacting how these kids are behaving at any given moment. Let's check out this scene. What are we having? Uh, it's just your standard regular lunch, I guess. Milk? Soup. Juice. I can read. P, B, and J with the crusts cut off. Well, Brian, this is a very nutritious lunch. All the food groups are represented. Did your mom marry Mr. Rogers? Uh, no, Mr. Johnson. Huh. Yeah. Here's my impression of life at Big Bry's house. Son? Yeah, Dad. How's your day, pal? Great, Dad. How's yours? Super. Say, son, how'd you like to go fishing this weekend? Great, Dad. But I've got homework to do. That's all right, son. You can do it on the boat. Gee. Dear. Isn't our son swell? Yes, dear. Isn't life swell? Oh. Oh. <clears throat> All right. What about your family? Oh, mine? Yeah. It's real easy. Stupid. 
worthless, no good, goddamn freeloading son of a bitch, retarded, big mouth, know it all, asshole, jerk. You forgot ugly, lazy, and disrespectful. Shut up, bitch! Go fix me turkey pot pie. What about you, Dad? Fuck you. No, Dad. What about you? Fuck you! No, Dad! What about you? Fuck you! Is that for real? You want to come over sometime? That's bullshit. It's all part of your image. I don't believe a word of it. You don't believe me? No. No? Did I stutter? You believe this? Huh? It's about the size of a cigar. Do I stutter? See, this is what you get in my house when you spill paint in the garage. See, I don't think that I need to sit with you fucking dildos anymore. This scene is particularly poignant, and it's really reflective of a lot of similar scenes that happen throughout the film, in which these characters engage in some fundamentally problematic attributions of the behaviors and communication actions of the other kids at the detention. What's going on is because they have their own individual social contexts. They have their own family circumstances, they have their own peer groups and social cliques that tend to be rather exclusionary of different kinds of people. They have real difficulty trying to understand why people are behaving in the way that they are. And they fall back on their own comfortable pre-existing assumptions. And this leads to the fundamental attribution error. They judge the behaviors and the actions of the other students at detention based on what they perceive are the intrinsic internal characteristics and personality aspects of these people, rather than taking into account the variety of different external contextual circumstances that lead them to behave in the ways that they do. Bender does this with regard to Brian and his family, and then Andrew does this with regard to Bender and his family. To conclude then, this video has been unpacking this complex and fascinating process of attribution. That kind of perceptual interpretation where we observe other people's behavior, especially their communicative actions, and construct explanations for them. Those explanations could be attributed to the internal personality and character of the people that we're observing. They can be attributed to other kinds of external impacts of the surrounding social context. They're impacted by a multiplicity of different kinds of factors, but sadly, we often oversimplify this process and make some basic errors in attribution that are heavily influenced by initial impressions and our own pre-constructed sense of individual and social norms that lead us to make judgments about other people. If you've got any questions about the process of attribution or any of the content in this video, please don't hesitate to reach out and let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.